Ladies and gentlemen, keep it going for Janet Hardy. The first thing I want you to know about my co-author, friend, co-collaborator, lover, et cetera, Dossie Easton, is that for almost since the first day of our 25-year relationship, we have been doing outrageous role-playing. It's what we do. It's how we roll. <laughs> the second thing I want you to know about Dossie is that when you do an erotic role-play with Dossie, it starts in her clothing closet because she's a high femme and that's the way she rolls. <laughs> so the story starts in Dossie's clothing closet um, where we're doing sort of this playing Barbies thing that she likes to do where she takes out an outfit and tries it on and you tell her how wonderful she looks and then she puts it away and <laughs> tries on another outfit. And we eventually narrow it down to the prom gowns. Now I want you to notice that that is plural. <laughs> as is tiaras. The prom gown we decide we like is pink. It, it's not exactly the one Glinda the Good Witch wore, but it's, it's within spitting distance of Glinda the Good Witch. It's pink with an enormous tulle skirt, many layers, uh, very dossy, and a tiara, of course. And the reason we're doing this is because we have a play party coming up the following weekend, and we're in the mood for something a little chewy in the way of a role play. Um, and so what we decide on is that she will be the prom queen. And part of what makes that wonderful is that neither of us is the kind of woman who ever got to be the prom queen. Um, so for this time, she gets to be the prom queen and I get to help her be the prom queen. And okay, well, what, where does that leave me? I do not do prom queen. <laughs> this is as femme as it gets, I'm sorry. Um, so I'm going to be the juvenile delinquent. who kidnaps her from the prom at, at knife point and beats her and rapes her. So we're at the party. Fast forward, you know, it's Saturday night. We're at the party. We've chatted, we've nibbled, we've done the things you do at the play party before anything happens. And then she's in using the bathroom. And I decide to wait behind the bathroom door and in my hand I have um, a knife, a very vicious looking knife. Now the thing about this knife, it's a, it's a wonderful toy because you could probably cut butter with it, but you couldn't cut hamburger with it. There is no fucking edge to this knife at all, but it looks vicious. So when she steps out and I put it to her throat, she doesn't know there's no edge to it. It feels like a knife, it's metal. And I step up behind her and snarl in her ear, don't you fucking move, bitch. And I could see the goosebumps come up <laughs> in the parts of her that are not covered with pink taffeta. Um, <laughs> and I take her downstairs to where the dungeon is and strap her down and throw all the layers of pink back up over her head so she can't see. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One of them is because, you know, while she's inside all the pink, she's imagining whatever makes the fantasy work for her. Uh, like a blindfold except pink. Um, and the, <laughs> the other reason is that one of the things we've negotiated as part of this scene is she wants to have her panties cut off. I should note here that there is a drawer at Dossie's house full of black lace panties that are cheap and for cutting off purposes. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, I remind you, this knife has no edge, hence the binding, because what I have to do is get out my paramedic shears, like, because like all good perverts, I carry paramedic shears in case someone has, has to get cut off. Out of. And she can't tell, because she's tied down and she can't see. So, moving forward, I, I start with some biting, because there's very biteable bits, and I cut the panties off, and... Oh God, I, you know, it was that kind of a scene. I think I caned her. I don't know where a juvenile delinquent is supposed, supposed to get a cane, but I had one and I caned her. Um, and I put clamps on and I took clamps off and 
She was screaming and sobbing and having a high old time, and so was I. Uh, we found out later that people at the party were whispering that I had actually fucked her with the knife. I did not actually fuck her with the knife. There are people in the world who know how to do that. There's a reason why I carry only a very blunt knife. I have no physical coordination whatsoever. I'm not the person you want to have a knife in your snatch. So. <laughs> But it looked like the kind of scene where I was going to fuck her with the knife. But the thing that happened for me as I was having a good old time is I started to hear things come out of my mouth that I didn't know I had in my head. The kinds of things that a truly bad person would say. Things like, I'm gonna show dirty little bitches like you what you're good for. You're only good to be fucked and thrown away. You know. I don't have to go and do the whole line of pattern. I don't want to because that's not a part of me I'm real comfortable with. Um, but in the context of the scene, a funny thing happens when you're topping that kind of scene because there's part of you that's right in there um, saying your lines, saying your pattern, and it's, it's part of you. You wouldn't be able to do it if it weren't part of you, if there weren't that angry, hateful, vengeful, predatory part of you, you wouldn't be able to say those things. But at the same time, there's the part of you that's standing back going, okay, if you turn her that way, you're gonna mess with her neck and you know her neck is fragile, so you can't do that. And so there, I had this sort of dual consciousness going on as it was going, but I had never heard myself say things like that. I didn't know I had that person inside me. So this other kind and sane and consensual person is standing there going, what the holy fuck is going on here? Um, but it all worked. It all worked. We both had a great time. So, you know, we finished the scene. I got her off. I got myself off. I, I, I fucked her with, with, with a strap on, of course, because you would have to, because you're a driven delinquent. Um, <laughs> and so we both got off, and I held her and brought her back down, and she held me, and it was all cuddly and good, and we swept all the toys into the toy bag, and we went to go back upstairs to where the food was. And, <laughs> come on, after that you need food. Um, at the bottom of the stairs, I was, you know, juvenile delinquent. I was with the strut and with the boots and with the dick. And by the time I got to the top of the stairs, my hands were doing like that vibrator she showed you a few minutes ago. My, my hands were just shaking. And it was the aftershocks of the scene hitting me. Um, what the fuck just happened? Who was that who said those things? And we went into the food room, and she plopped down on the couch with these yards of pink just spreading around her. And I sat down in the middle of all that pink, and leaned back against her knees and said, would you just pet me, please? Um, and so she did. I hadn't bothered to put my shirt back on because I don't like shirts. Um, and <laughs> so she, she petted my head. My hair was all slicked back because I was a juvenile delinquent. So she, she pe petted my head and she rubbed my shoulders and she smoothed me down and I waited I felt like crying, but she was taking good care of me, so I didn't cry. But I waited until I was a little bit less shaky. She fed me. And I, I was kind of okay. And I was able to drive home. By the time I drove home, all I wanted to do was call her and say, are we okay? I didn't, because it was late and she had a long way to drive. But the next morning, you bet your ass I was on the telephone, um, <laughs> going, are we okay? Yeah, of course we're okay, she says. Um, why, why shouldn't we be okay? Well, I don't know. I, that was really scary last night, and I think I need to know that you still like me. Um, and she said, of course I like you. When can we do it again? <laughs> <laughs> but that, that persona, and uh, it, he's reemerged. I tell people I have multiple male top personae and they all belong in a state hospital for the criminally insane. Um, <laughs> he's come back and he would come back more often if Dossie wanted. But 
or you know, it, actually, if she had her way, he would be back all the time. Um, <laughs> but for me, it was this journey into this darkness inside me, this shadow um, of cruelty and anger and sadism and a rage that, you know, it's not the kind of thing that you want to know about yourself. But I had just put it out there for, for me to learn. And so I think the reason I wanted to, to tell this story tonight is because the aftermath, I mean, I'm a switch. And what I learned is that when you ask someone to go into that dark space, which we do when we play with that kind of thing, or even if we're not doing over role playing, we go into that, that darkness that might be the toppy darkness of cruelty and anger and predatoriness and whatever. And it might be the bottom space of tininess and helplessness and the pain that we hold from being tiny and helpless. Those are big asks. Those are big things to ask somebody. And we need to acknowledge that vulnerability. And we need to take good care of ourselves and the people we love when we do things like that. And that's why I chose to tell this, that story now. Thank you.